I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education, Monday, August 8th, 2022, at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. And Member Hughes is absent. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on the, in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These will be placed in the basket on the table to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment. Um, first item on the agenda to get to is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Listed on tonight's agenda are six communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? Um, Seeing none and hearing none, let's move on to our spotlight with uh, Dr. Russell's back to school update. Okay. Well, thank you. A um, little different than the last couple summers, especially last August. You remember we had a separate meeting uh, for uh, our update and return to plan, or excuse me, return to school plan. Uh, this year it's obviously a much more scaled back presentation, but nonetheless we wanted to take this opportunity to update the board and update the community on the plans for uh, the start of school here in a couple weeks. I also want to thank Jessica Stewart. Uh, who has uh, assisted you know our planning process uh, just like previous years our entire TNL team and then finally our health and safety team that consists of staff members and uh, district administrators as we pour through all the guidance and uh, you know determine what the best course of action moving forward is so the goals of this presentation it will be very short and brief but it's to again review our overarching goals during the pandemic update uh, the board and community if there are any current mandates and provide you know again just that general update for what school will look like when students return throughout the pandemic we've really tried to always stay consistent with our priorities which are to provide an educational experience for students and staff that closely aligned with normal school we always want to minimize the disruptions to the educational process and then of course prioritizing the health and safety of our students and staff just a general overview we're going to start the school year in a very similar manner uh, as to the way we ended in the spring uh, we returned to normal operating procedures last school year um, however we were you know just introducing things like field trips or reintroducing them this year we're starting off like it was 2019 in terms of field trips sports clubs activities buses lining up to schools all of that will look very similar so just some general overview again continued the CDC guidance has been adopted by IDPH and the DCHD that should be nothing new that's the same guidance from the spring uh, we're encouraging as always our families to review that health guidance again we're encouraging families to make choices that best fit their needs uh, masks and vaccines have not and will not be mandatory if a student or staff member is positive we will adhere to the isolation requirements mandated by the IDPH and the DCHD those have not changed uh, since the springtime uh, remote learning again must be made available to anyone under mandatory isolation from COVID-19 so again if a child has to stay home or um, you know because they're positive we will provide that remote learning in a manner that was similar to the spring um, additional safety protocols and accommodations may be put into place for students with an IEP or a 504 plan or even a medical emergency plan depending on uh, the student we will continue to plan for emergency situations including drills that prepare our students for these unlikely scenarios we'll continue to clean our school buildings throughout the school day and evenings uh, following the specific protocols called for in the guidance I want to thank Kevin Bardo and Jeff Neustadt for their leadership and all of our maintenance and um, uh, custodial employees they do a fantastic job and they have throughout the uh, pandemic uh, social emotional learning always remains a cornerstone of what we're trying to do during the pandemic it's natural that kids have questions and they're feeling that uncertainty we're going to continue to support our students um, we're going to continue to work with our nursing staff and the DCHD uh, to make sure that everybody has that up-to-date information uh, that we provide that to them so families can be confident uh, that we're following and, and really talking to the experts here 
And um, again, the approach we're taking this year, very similar to what you saw in the spring and in line with uh, what our neighboring districts are proposing as well. In terms of testing, um, there is a big change with testing. Um, now it is widely available outside of school. The good news is, and this board has always asked us to make sure that we help those in need and um, make sure that testing is available to those that are in need. So since the spring, IDPH has been sending school districts and we've been requesting uh, take home tests that we could hand out to families that were in need um, for a test. So no one would have to go without a test if their child was symptomatic or if they needed that. Uh, PPE is also available, uh, not only for our staff, but for those in need as well. We know that the research out there on KND KN95 masks and N95 masks is very positive, and so we want to make sure that that is a, available for our nursing staff, our, our general staff, and then of course our students should they need it. While the dashboard is discontinued, uh, we do continue to track cases internally. That way in case something takes place where the uh, health department wants to talk to us in the same way that we would keep track of all the other illnesses that take place in school from everywhere from sore throats to head lights to you name it, we do continue to track all of those internally. Uh, again, we're looking forward to starting the school year in the same way we ended uh, last year. Uh, we want to continue to focus in on the positives and, and again I want to underscore that we've come a long way uh, together. We've had some long nights in this room but uh, again I just want to underscore that I think we've done a really nice job in District 58. I think we've fared better than most districts because again we do work in conjunction so closely with our families and making sure that we put the best interests of our students and staff first. So that is it in terms of the update of what school will look like. Again just some high level summary very similar to the spring and uh, we'll continue to make testing and PPE available for those who need it. Questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm okay. very positive. Yeah, okay. we're looking forward to it. Thank you very much for that update. Moving on to reports to the board. First up, we have the superintendent's report with Dr. Russell again. Okay, looks like I'm up again here. Uh, this one is more of a lengthier update simply because it's the summer. I uh, want to commend our curriculum and instruction department. Uh, to date, we've got about 85% of the materials that we need to deliver to the schools already in the schools. Over the next week and a half, uh, Justin and his team will continue to do that. Um, we are uh, you know, getting everything out of the district service center and making sure that we get it out to the schools. Uh, we don't anticipate any issues with that, so all the students will have their materials on time. And again, I wanna thank our summer staff, uh, especially our, our high school crew for uh, getting everything uh, together, so thank you. We're gonna skip the finance portion of this presentation as we have a discussion coming up a little bit later that will entail a lot of those um, components. Uh, for personnel, we're excited to welcome 35 new staff members to District 58 during our new teacher week, which begins the week of August 15th. I think when I was a new teacher, we had 43, and, and so again, another big group. Uh, this week for new teachers offers a wide range of activities and support to help new employees transition to District 58. As with all school districts across the country, we'll continue to work on filling multiple positions, primarily instructional assistants, clerical staff, custodians, and substitutes. Uh, we are on target to be ready for students in two and a half weeks, but due to, um, you know, filling some positions in, in these particular areas, we do anticipate that we'll be hiring into the school year, which again, is not uncommon. Our enrollment has remained consistent with the projections from last June. There are no changes to the staffing plan at this point. Um, as always, Jane will come back in September and she will give you the final numbers of all where we're at and we'll look at all those sections, but those sections that we will share with you in May and June, no changes at this point. Technology, our, our tech department has been working diligently on a variety of projects this summer. I wanna commend them uh, for making sure that everything is ready for our students. You know, we talk about 5,000 students now with individual devices, that's no small task, and they've done a great job as well, so I wanna thank them for their hard work. Uh, student devices are set up and ready for distribution. New staff devices are set up, and they're also ready for distribution. Uh, we've implemented a new endpoint detection solution on staff devices. Uh, we've updated our phone system software, and we're working in partnership with principals and building secretaries to complete student schedules. Please note that each school will receive a unique time on August 15th. That's when they'll get their class assignments, because I know our community is always interested in that date and their middle school schedules. 
Uh, the PowerSchool server, which has given us some issues over the last couple of years, what we decided to do this year, so we don't overload their servers, because um, even though they've guaranteed us that we won't have a problem, uh, we seem to always have an issue with that. And so what we've done is we're going to assign each school a different time that they can go in and get their class assignment. And then also at the middle schools, they can get their uh, schedule. We don't want to overload the system. The principals will communicate that out ahead of time so everyone will know their designated time. Uh, but each school, again, will get that unique time. And that will all come on the 15th. Student services, we're looking forward to welcoming many new special service staff next week during our new teacher training week. We're pleased to share that we are fully staffed for certified positions with the exception of one half-time preschool teacher position. We encourage any community members interested in this or an instructional assistant or even a building RN position uh, to apply. So what we're seeing in terms of the staffing shortages across schools is the more specialized a position becomes, the harder and harder it is to fill, which I don't think is a surprise, but certainly we want to continue um, looking for those uh, applicants. In terms of public relations and community relations, next week the Education Foundation of District 58 will host two of its signature events. First, the foundation will hold Sneak Preview, a seventh grade orientation event at Herrick and O'Neill. Sneak Preview is a fantastic program that helps incoming seventh graders meet new friends and teachers, learn how to follow a schedule, and simple things that are big deals to seventh and eighth graders like practicing how to open your locker. Uh, this is an event that has gone on since I was a teacher in school, and uh, we want to thank our foundation for supporting that. Uh, it does help ease the transition to middle school. In addition, the foundation will hold its new teacher luncheon. This annual event connects our new teachers with several community partners including the police and fire departments the library the park district and of course the foundation we really appreciate the education foundation putting this together it's really nice when we can have all the different um, groups in the village get together and meet our new teachers facilities Contractors continue to push on work towards the goal of wrapping up the various locations in the next two weeks. If you've driven by our schools, you'll see there's a lot of work going on, especially in masonry projects. Overall, the various summer projects have been successful despite some delays. Delays have been caused from continued supply chain issues and labor shortages or even strikes. That was the case in the asphalt uh, industry. We continue to work with our consultants and contractors to execute as much as we can prior to the start of the school year. Some facets of projects, such as some of the masonry and fire alarm replacement, will be pushed to the summer of 23, as this work can't be completed on school days or various break times. We're happy to bring these much needed changes to several of our schools. You may have also noticed that construction is beginning on a new shared facility with the village of Downers Grove, if you've looked outside. Once completed, the new Civic Center will be home to the village's administrative offices, the Downers Grove Police Department, and District 58. We're very excited about this partnership as it truly benefits the taxpayers of both District 58 and the village of Downers Grove. In closing, we're beyond excited to begin this school year. While there are certainly challenges in front of us due to staff shortages, increased costs due to inflation, construction delays, COVID-19, aging facilities, we will continue to meet these challenges head on. I know that our district will continue to lead thanks to our support board, great students, a staff that's second to none, wonderful families, and an invested community. It's going to be a great year, and we can't wait to start. That concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions? Okay. Next on the agenda is our, our committee reports. Uh, first up is the policy committee, which has not met since the last board meeting. Uh, what well, we skipped? One sec. Month of oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. That's okay. Todd, I, how could I? Uh, <laughs> up next is Mr. Dre, followed with our monthly business and treasures report. And it's a short one. Uh, so we have a discussion piece later on uh, in the agenda. Uh, on the uh, monthly business report, uh, we simply have the tentative budget posted there. That will be on display for 30 days. Uh, it'll be posted for a hearing, and there'll be a hearing at the September board meeting uh, before the board approves um, that budget at that point. Uh, budget follows the um, financial plan that the, the board did approve back in April. Um, a couple things, uh, it does follow the 35% fund balance policy that has uh, yeah, any balance at 35% you know, of expenditures for operations. It also has in there, um, as we have put in the plan, about a, a million dollars transfer each year going forward for uh, out of operational funds into capital. Uh, this has a, a little split, uh, $500,000 to capital, $500,000 to debt lease payment. Uh, and to explain that, uh, as part of the 
uh, intergovernmental agreement the board did approve with the village last month um, for its potentially 50 year lease uh, of uh, into the village hall. Um, with working with the village, uh, our first 25 years is about a million to uh, you know 200,000. In working with them and, and, and talking to them, obviously, if we can prepay some of that while they have construction going on, that lowers their cost of, that lowers what they have to borrow, lowers the interest rate, you know, the, the interest costs, and lowers some of their costs for the village overall. Uh, so as part of our, you know, working through our budget process, um, we're structuring so that the next several years while construction is on place, we would make payments um, and equal to that twenty, that first twenty-five years of lease. So therefore, as we enter into the lease, or as we enter into moving over to the village hall at that point, we would not have that operational cost um, at that point. We would have paid off, and we would have been able to keep uh, the overall cost down of the project for uh, all of the community of Downers Grove. Uh, so, in that um, budget, you have. That split of that ha of that million dollars half going to that debt uh, and half going to to capital uh, fund, um, and so that's in that in the in the display budget, uh, and that will come back to the board uh, for hearing and approval uh, at the September. And that's all I have for the business report, uh, and we'll have more later on. There's questions on that. I'll ask a question. Uh, there's a clear benefit to taxpayers and to the village for us doing a prepayment towards their construction costs. I imagine those funds in some way impact us in our, our daily you know, annual operations. Uh, can you speak a little bit to where that's, what, that, what impact that might have? Um, y yes. I mean, uh, operation, well, there's two things. One, um, it does reduce our, you know, what we have available for capital. Um, Depending on you know results of the next few months, uh, how that turns out, um, you know, we may want to talk about a shift uh, the next year or so. But it, what it does do is remove that expenditure uh, of operations going forward for the next 25 years of that you know 40 some odd thousand dollars or 50 thousand dollars a year um, in that we owe it and, and that we have it. it and in some ways, it is the um, is the benefit of the downtown TIF rolling off, and some of that those funds were able to pledge towards uh, that part that that plan and project to use that going forward. Now, depending on what happens in November, you know, in in the next couple fiscal years, we may have to you know we want to retool some of that and spread it out a little bit. Um, there. Our conversations have been really uh, productive, and you know they're they're flexible in in, in the structure. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the policy committee has not met since the last board meeting. Uh, the legislative committee similarly has not met since the last board meeting. The, the financial advisory committee has met, but as I understand, their, their report is going to be woven into our discussion item coming up later on the agenda, so we're going to uh, wait on that one. The district leadership team has not met since the last board meeting, and the health and wellness committee has not met since the last board meeting, which brings us to our discussion item, which are our options for potential construction projects. Once again, Mr. Drayfall. Getting my steps in. <laughs> <coughs> Before we go to the conversation about uh, with the FAC, we wanted to uh, to, kind of to bring up uh, some of the questions people have had and, and concerned about uh, the current structure and economy and, and the numbers that we have talked about for some time, um, both with the capital projects and but overall what the what the bond costs are. Uh, as the board may recall, we talked about um, we we've gone through and worked on a market analysis of $179 million uh, bond issue and what that cost would be. Uh, at the time, uh, now six, nine months ago, or better, uh, we determined it was about a $0.23 cent 
uh, impact to property taxes. We did a very conservative number, presuming that there would be uh, an increase in bond rates from the time that we set that to the time that we would be issuing it. Obviously, certainly before the current economic conditions that we are we are experiencing, um, that has eroded some. And so, what we have done is, is gone back and we looked at these. Uh, the markets, and we continually work with and talk to uh, underwriters and so forth to see where the markets are at. Uh, the markets have done some very strange things over the last six months. Um, where the rates are today are actually much lower than where they were before the Federal Reserve rate went up. And that's because there were some other uh, influences into the bond market, uh, namely pension funds and insurance companies. Um, liquidating their uh, portions or significant portions of their municipal bond rate, of their municipal bonds, and cashing them out, whether it was for cash to buy something else or whether it was for cash because they had a cash hit, we don't know. Um, but essentially, that drove the market up even higher uh, and did some things. That has come down now, um, and it still is a bit more above. So where we're at is we still believe we're within the 23 to 25 cent range of increase. So we current projection would be about a two, two cent increase from what our, our first initial number was. And you can see on there we have the differential um, of what we had talked about previously at a $250,000 house at $191 increase or a $300,000 at $229 um, with a 25 cent increase in rate. Um, we'd be at 211, 211, 253, and you can see the rest of the numbers there accordingly. Um, that still keeps us as one of the lowest or the lowest tax elementary school tax rates in DuPage County. Our current rate that we uh, hit uh, at the end for this tax year was $1.98. Um, we still are under, and Addison is the next one um, right above us. Uh, we still would be under their rate, uh, which is about 26 cents higher than ours. Um, again, you know, the markets are, are the markets. There are things we can do as far as adjusting how we issue the bonds, if we issue them all at once or, or do separate issues, you know, once and then once are current and then one a few years later. Um, it'll be dependent upon what happens when we, you know, if board places the, the question on the ballot and if it is successful um, and then we'll, as we go through the next steps and, and what's available. But that's uh, an update on the on the finance side of that. We wanted to make the board aware um, that it was helpful. We were conservative in adding rate, you know, adding uh, interest rate into that so that we, we had that coverage. Uh, we've used, we're, we're pushing up against that at this point. We want to make sure or transparent and let people know that you know it could be a bit higher than the 23 and maybe up to 25 given current conditions uh, the other question is obviously the um, master's facility plan was done several years ago our initial piece was and, and uh, through community involvement and work um, the initial number was pared down to a focus on secure entrances, uh, updated HVAC air conditioning, uh, additions to the middle school to manage the overcrowding, uh, as well as uh, working through a number of years of the maintenance and updates that need to happen uh, at, at our schools. Um, we all know what we do at the grocery store, we're paying at the gas pump. You know, inflation has had an impact on on everything that we are doing and buying. Um, certainly in construction, that is also a factor. Um, we are looking at and know that there will be some limitations on what we can do, particularly looking at that last bullet point of roof replacements and maintenance and how many years back we can go. We looked at when the master's facility plan was put together, a 20 plus year uh, analysis of what we really needed to do to update our facilities. When the number came, when we, when we pared down, we took out 
playgrounds, we took out electrical updates, we took out lighting updates, um, and we said, this is through the committee and, and the task force, this is where we want to be with you know, how much, uh, how many years we can do in maintenance updates. Um, what we're going to tell you tonight, and you know, should be too much of a surprise, is there may be some limits when we get to into that, again, presuming that the board you know, puts a question on the ballot and it's successful in November. Um, as to how much of that work, and it'll be dependent on, you know, what the market is when we go out. This is, we're looking at four years of operation, of maintenance and construction. Um, we know the market today was not what the market was three months ago, six months ago, a year ago. Um, you know, there may be some adjustments that come, come, come upon that. Um, we also have interest income that we did not anticipate because we have an interest rate now that when we invest money, we're going to get a return on that money. Um, whereas previously, that was not something that we were really looking at because the rates were as close to zero as possible. Uh, so we wanted to make uh, the board aware of that and kind of and, and talk that through, just you know, be aware of sort of the, the elephant in the room that we all kind of have know about is that you know we have some additional costs that are coming in uh, and how those things manage now we did have some projects that came in below budget this year we had some things that came in significantly above where we anticipated when we put out the capital but we had a couple that came in below the expectations um, you know we can hope for those uh, we certainly are you know uh, aren't Pollyannish though and, and knowing that there's going to be some increases I should go maybe Questions on that piece before our discussion on that before we move on to the next step. Okay. The financial advisory committee, um, in the last few months, we've put through um, an RFQ, a request for qualifications for construction management. Uh, firms and that is where we're really at the next step as we're kind of moving through our progression um, as you know the board has has on the agenda for this evening and looking at uh, potential of a referendum we have had it, the district has an architect and engineering firm um, that has done the work for the master's facility plan and, and, and been working on uh, estimates at this point we need to move towards the next step uh, and that is securing uh, a firm that is on the construction side so that that estimation can be done. Uh, review of, of documents is starting to work in that partnership collaboration format uh, to have that aspect. Now, there's a few different formats to do this. Uh, there is the design, bid, and build. I said design, build, and, and Kevin Bardo's correcting me. He's like, we still bid. Uh, there's a design, bid, and build format where it's a much, it's a faster process that as soon as there's enough <coughs> to go that it gets going, it goes through and, and, and it's that similar how District 99 uh, operated where uh, White and Company uh, was uh, engineer, is one of, the, one of the few firms that can do this and that is that they have engineers, architects and construction management um, on, on staff in one um, uh, entity. And so they're able to execute on that format uh, and do that, that, that structure. There's also uh, construction management, which is where you retain a separate firm that uh, works in collaboration with the district, uh, district contracts with that firm, um, and they go through and evaluate and, and work with White uh, as the architect and engineers uh, to develop and uh, bid packs for the work to be done, to put it out into the street, um, and to be bid out, and then they uh, and their expertise is in the construction side. Uh, we're very fortunate to have White that has that background because they're able to give and do some of that work for us, and and we've certainly been able to take advantage of some of that as we've put put through um, the hundred and seventy, you know, the, the how much this is and where this is at. Um, but you know, having a separate firm also has a different aspect and a different look. There's two types of construction management, uh, agency and at risk. We'll talk about those in a minute as to what the differences are. So um, 
But those are the three formats. Uh, we've kind of we've worked through this with the with the FAC, and they have a recommendation uh, that we'll get to in a minute. Design build, as I said, is uh, it, we have the same firm. Uh, they accelerated build bid schedule. Um, things move a little bit faster in this format. Um, the negatives are that you have one firm looking at everything, and sometimes. Um, you know, not having that separate set of eyes, uh, there has some potential of, of savings and structure that may happen uh, from a separate con uh, construction management firm. Uh, so that is the one piece that has a, there could be some potential savings that might be missed um, in, you know, in that format. Construction. There we go. Uh, construction management firm, an agency, uh, is you hire a separate firm. They work for the district. Um, they put all the bid, they review the architect's work. Um, their expertise is in construction. Uh, they're going to hopefully make some suggestions. Um, and they package things out so that when they go out to bid, uh, it's, it's an efficient format for uh, the district to, uh, you know, for, for trades and so forth so that we have an efficient, effective system that has a low bid uh, that is by responsive bidder. Um, the diff the, uh, there's a potential savings piece that we talked about, um, but you could have a longer per process than the design build. The agency, there's a difference between agency and uh, at risk. Uh, the agency works for the district um, it puts it all those bids together. It goes through the subs. It will help evaluate, and then it turns it over to the district. And so, what the district then has to do is one: we have to we would have to check all of the bid bonds to ensure that the insurance companies are current, have the bond. The bond is still good. Um, we would also hold all of those contracts. And, all of the, and then we would also then have to execute on any warranty uh, follow-up work. Um, and we would be at risk if a sub failed to, to perform, I'll, you know, we would go back to the construction manager and work with them to find a solution. Uh, but at the end, uh, there's a liability and a risk that the district absorbs at a higher level than in, in a different format. Um, it is when we're looking at what would be essentially 160, 170 million dollars of real work over the next four or five years, uh, a significant level of not just paperwork but verification and risk that the district would take on and manage. And we certainly would have to retain some additional staff uh, to cover that uh, and, and to manage that, that level. It's just not a structure we're set up for. Construction manager at risk, um, similar format, but in this position, in this structure, the construction manager takes all the responsibility and the risk. They're responsible, same bid packs go out, same structure goes out, uh, same approval bidding process uh, of a low responsible bidder uh, happens, just like, you know, follows the code, just like um, the other aspect. But in this case, um, Construction manager verifies that the bond, the, the bids are there, that the insurance is valid, uh, follows up on all of the warranty work, um, is going to pay out and handle all the mechanics liens, and all of that to ensure uh, that that firm, that the subcontractors are, are are doing their job. There, the construction manager is ultimately responsible to the district for all of the work being performed, uh, and it is on their insurance liability risk uh, that everything sits. So they're the ones that are going to follow through and make sure everything is done properly. All the warranty work um, after construction is done, you still have two or three years of warranty work that, that goes through, any updates or any you know, punch lists, those type of things. Um, all of that goes through and, and when you think about we're going to be into a construction phase, potential construction phase, for four to five years, 
that warranty work goes a few more years beyond that. We're into this for seven years or more. Um, and so having that aspect and having that expertise has, you know, has a benefit to it. Now there's a cost to that. Um, people don't take on risk without having, you know, uh, taking on their, their, their payment and so forth. So there is an additional piece uh, an expense that goes to to that level um, so that's agency or that's at risk so I think I've kind of covered through uh, the difference the differences between the two um, the process and the payments and the risk piece and, and, and handling the sub work and, and so forth. Uh, the FAC uh, we reviewed and, and we have gone through and put out the RFQ uh, we, we received nine submissions. Uh, we reviewed those um, on a paper format and with uh, kind of a smaller group. Uh, and then from that, we whittled it down to five uh, and, and, the, and did five interviews. Um, and we've had a conversation both as a group, uh, as that smaller group, but then also at the FAC meeting on Friday uh, to come up to uh, what the recommendation was in, in reviewing all of this. And that is that given the size of work to be done, the size of our structure and what we have, uh, as well as, you know, minimizing liability and risk and, and, and tr you know, trusting experts um, and, and so forth, that the FAC recommendation would be to do a CM at risk uh, format. Um, and, and that we would bring to the board, uh, because this is an RFQ process and we're following uh, the statute under um, professional services, a top three list of firms uh, to the board mm -hmm. at the September board meeting for the board to approve. Uh, the structure works similar to what architectural uh, work does, where we have a ranking of the top three. We enter into a conversation and attempt to work and, and to create a contract with the top uh, firm. If we are unable to reach terms uh, with a contract with that firm, then we would move down to the second one and so forth until we've, um, we've cleared that list. We certainly don't expect to do that. We expect to be able to find a you know, contract with the first firm. Um, but that would be the format. It's, as I said, similar to an architectural uh, structure for professional services. Uh, and so that's uh, what uh, we've gone through with the FAC and their recommendation uh, to the board at this point um, is to move into that format. And at that, I will take questions and discussion. And I will add that if Kevin Russell or Kevin Bardo or Sally have anything else to add, please. So jump in anything I missed yeah again just to be clear this is if the board were to vote in the affirmative to put a referendum on the ballot in November and if the voters pass it one of the things we of course have to be very sensitive to is not to initiate all this work or cost the taxpayers money before they've had a chance to, to, to weigh in that being said if the taxpayers do support a referendum if the board were to, to vote for that tonight we do have to have things lined up and, and ready to go. In terms of these <laughs> models, design, build, or you know, uh, construction management, the reason we wanted to bring that forward to you today is so that you could let this all digest, ask a few questions tonight, certainly bring this back in September and continue the conversation. There are examples of both of these models, again, as Todd shared, District 99, uh, went with more of the design bid and build uh, with, with uh, white, where other districts like uh, a Maine or in Elmhurst went with a construction management uh, type of a piece. That definitely is more of the, um, I would say, more traditional approach, the construction management. Um, certainly, the only thing that I would weigh in at this particular point is, given the scope of the you know proposed work that we're discussing, you currently don't have the bandwidth inside of the district to manage a construction project. I, I don't think the board is expecting that, nor the community. So um, the construction management um, at risk 
would be the one that I would lean toward um, if you did decide to go in the construction management route simply because we would need that expertise of having that construction management taking on um, you know that that bigger role because we wouldn't be able to do that as a as a district staff so under what circumstances would a school district not necessarily our school district um, elect to go the route of a construction management firm under the agency model if you have a big high school district that has a large structure and is in continually doing work um, you know, like in Arlington you know and someone that's got four or five schools that they can you know every year they're doing four or five six eight million dollars they have a structure more often uh, that they're able to, to take that on and do some of that work um, is it they have I've done that or unit or district. Like you have that. more staff built yeah. in okay. to manage that. As an example, a long, a long time ago, uh, when I first got started at West Aurora, we did similar to that. Um, we hired several additional staff. Uh, one person was purely the accounts payable person for just construction for four years. Um, we, you know, and we have thir and 13,000, 12,000 students and so many extra bu you know, buildings. And we built new schools and we did additions and you know so um, but we had a structure and a format uh, and a lot of help to do it and that and we did it in that format. Any other questions? Again the, the point of this is, is more of just an introduction today. Uh, great conversation at, with the FAC on Friday Certainly, um, you know, any questions that you have as we go, we're, we're more than uh, willing to, to meet with any member who want to save those questions for September when we talk about this further, that is absolutely fine. But again, I just want to underscore, this doesn't happen unless the board votes to put the referendum on and then the community supports it. So in the uh, presentation, I saw that the focus areas are going to be health and safety um, and certain maintenance, right? And then there's going to be other projects as funded, right? And, um, you know, I know that we've done several roofing and building envelope projects in the last couple of years. They've been very important to do. How are those getting prioritized? What was the conversation like on Friday um, around that uh, maintenance projects that need to be done? So in terms of the prioritization, we go back to that master facility plan. Right. And we look at, when you look at that, you, you've got time frames in terms of when all those things would have to get done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, years one through four, years one through eight. They, what's contained in that master facility support. And so in terms of the priorities, we would seek the ones that are called um, for to be addressed earlier first. And then anything that happens that we would need to immediately address, like the Highland Roof repair this summer. So that would be the prioritization that we would, you know, continue to follow. It's what the architect has worked with us in our master facility plan in terms of what needs to be done first in terms of the um, maintenance of, of projects. Certainly those bigger items, though, remain the priority. Mm -hmm. Safety and security, um, overhauling all the HVAC systems, expanding the middle schools um, for the middle school concept and to help alleviate um, you know, overcrowding at the north side schools. Those are, are non-negotiables in the package and then getting as far as we can on the maintenance um, is possible. That's how we would address it. We would go uh, in conjunction with the architect, make sure um, we're hitting those high need things first and then anything after that. And then um, just want to make a clarification because I read through everything again to kind of get an idea of where everything was. And um, uh, I know that you have electrical uh, as an under maintenance, but there's also just electrical panel updates, et cetera, that go with the addition and the HVAC, and those would be included in those focus area projects, right? Right. Any any elect anything that goes to supporting the necessity of supporting the air conditioning and, and or you know the additions and that types that would be included in those those top three areas. Mm -hmm. um, what is not what has not included in that piece. Uh, and actually what is not in 179 at all was uh, lighting replacement LED, yes. um, and, and and some of that work and, and in some cases uh, you know when you hit that then you're into some other electrical updates um, those are something we still are going to have to work on and, and look um, and that's an area that we will 
we have explored a bit and we will certainly do so in earnest as, as we move through this process um, that there isn't available opportunities for, for grants right. uh, and rebates and so forth as, as those come up. Um, and that's part of the reason why that was included in, you know, that was set aside as part of, not part of the, the referendum. There's other opportunities that will exist out there. In, And additionally, the, you know, the, the continual structure to put a million dollars a year right. uh, into capital, and as we continue to look for maintenance grants from the state and so forth to help fund some of those extra things. Yeah, as we typically do with some of the capital, and it's nice that we're going to have potentially the ability to create a capital fund like that, so I think that's important. Also, a question about the cost differential between design bid build CM at risk, CM agency. Can you speak to degree orders of magnitude there? I don't. I, I don't. I, I you know. I'm not sure on the on the you know the, the magnitude on the agency and risk is going to be probably between a half a percent and a percent, depending on you know where we're at with negotiations and, and the risk piece that you know what's included in in the CM and all of the work um, you know, because that usually is part of that that aspect when they when, when certainly when an entity is going to take on the, the liability of a hundred million plus um, you know, there's a percentage of that I don't know if I can speak to where how much the differential between CM and design build they're all pretty close um, you know there may be some savings piece in having one entity uh, I think that is in likelihood, you know, what 99 is done, you know, when, how uh, 99 handled theirs um, because you've got some, some savings pieces into that where you have one entity and there's one, one mobilization cost uh, where you don't have a CM that has a mobilization that's got some impact. So that, that could be a half a percent. Thank you very much, Todd. You're welcome. Up next on our agenda is public comments. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask you to keep comments to a um, five minute limit to allow opportunity, everyone an opportunity to speak. At this time we receive two cards. We will ask each person who submit a card to please come, in, uh, come up to the podium, state your name and your attendance area and then provide your public comment. Uh, first up is um, Marshall Schmidt. Good evening, my name is Marshall Schmidt. I'm a, in the Pierce Downer attendance area. I'm here as an individual, as a resident of Downers Grove for most of the last 50 years. This evening, the board is poised to approve a bond referendum for $175 million to supposedly pay for a wish list of projects that the board has been discussing for at least three years. In the coming weeks, I will have more to say about the problems with the referendum, but tonight I want to take my allotted time to highlight some of its biggest problems. Let me begin by saying I wish that there were unlimited funds to enhance the school district. Of course, our kids deserve nothing less, but the reality is that funds are not unlimited. The board and community must set priorities because every dollar that is raised in a successful referendum is a dollar that homeowners in the community do not have to spend for their families. The reality here is that the referendum is an ill-conceived effort that fails to address priorities. First, the referendum is based on terribly outdated information. The cost estimates in the master plan were prepared based on a 10-year-old assessment that was supposedly updated in 2018-19 based on undocumented information provided by the staff. Tonight, Mr. Drayfall's presentation made my point for me. He got up here and said it's going to cost more than you thought it was going to cost, and you don't know what it's going to buy because the markets are so uncertain and no analysis has been done, no comprehensive analysis has been done of the effects of the recent changes. The $179 amount was calculated in 2019 before the pandemic was even on the horizon. 
The pandemic has radically disrupted the supply chain, as Mr. Drayfall mentioned, and altered the needs of the district. But I was unable to find anywhere in the board archives any detailed analysis of the impact on the pandemic on the already outdated 2019 analysis. The other consequence of using outdated numbers is that inflation has dramatically increased, which has the effect of allowing the district to raise its tax assessment more than in recent memory. One reason why the district was unable to perform certain required maintenance was that it was limited in its ability to raise taxes in any given year. That limitation has eased with inflation, but the $179 million number has not changed, and homeowners have less buying power. The bottom line is the referendum will lock the community into paying higher taxes, while at the same time the district can further increase your taxes each year in the assessment, a double or triple whammy to say the least. Second, the wish list of projects supposedly included in the referendum reveals several problematic projects. The proposed projects include building onto each of the middle schools to reconfigure the middle school to include sixth grade. Although an admirable goal, given recent research, the district three years ago when it was preparing its master facilities plan did not seriously consider using the buildings that it has to accomplish the same goal, including a building, Puffer, that was built as a middle school. Instead, the board is proposing to ignore the buildings it has, make two of the buildings bigger, which will increase the maintenance requirements for those buildings, while the district will still need to maintain the other buildings. The proposal to build on existing buildings will only increase that burden without providing for a plan to continue to pay for that maintenance with non-referendum funds. All sixth grade students will be moved out of their existing buildings, creating empty classrooms in some. Dr. Russell alluded to overcrowding. Not all of the schools in the district are overcrowded. The stability of the population is such that this is not a school district that is increasing in population. You need to figure out a way to even out the attendance areas so that you make use of the buildings you have, not increase the size of the buildings. In short, as the district has consistently done the last three years, it is ignoring the resources at its disposal to spend more money on new and shiny facilities without making maximum use of the facilities it already has. A slightly different issue is raised by the proposal uh, to provide air conditioning in the buildings on the basis that the children suffer in classrooms because of heat on a handful of days at the end of the school year. During the engagement process on the referendum, board members complained about their children having to dodge leaks in the roof. Now the board is contending that the real issue is warm classrooms a few days a year. School districts need to have priorities. Yes, it would be great if the classrooms on a handful of days were cooler, but the district does not prioritize roofs as was clear in the uh, most recent slide where roofs are now at the bottom of the uh, list. At bottom, this referendum and the analysis that, the outdated analysis that was used does not provide for how you're going to pay for the ongoing maintenance, which is the reason that was given for the referendum in the first place. So before voting on any referendum, the public needs to make the board describe precisely where the money for the referendum is going, force the board to link every dollar raised with a truly necessary expenditure, and require the board to explain how it intends to pay for the increased costs that will, that will incur as a result. I'll be back next month with more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Smetana. Hi guys, uh, Steve Smetana. My kids go to Highland. Uh, one will be going to here. Um, I'm back. Uh, I was here, not, not here, I was in front of the board um, early 2022, talking about the Accelerated Placement Act talking about the obligations that the district has. I passed out, uh, I think, the statute to all of you. Um, and I thought we were gonna have some progress, and I was hopeful that this year we would be in a place where we'd be in compliance with it. We still aren't. Um, I've been working with the administration, trying uh, gently, kind of poking them, reminding them of the 
kind of ongoing obligation. And to date, the same problem exists as it did in the beginning of 2022. I don't know what else to do, uh, short of taking other action. I don't really want to do that. I, I just would like the administration to live up to their obligations under the law, which is that if a kid is ready for the next level, that they figure out how to deliver that for that student. Um, specifically, I'm talking, so starting third grade, all kids are evaluated, um, but the statute requires that any kid that is ready for the next level is given the next level. So we're talking about math, because I think in reading they, they do have different groups. We're, we're really talking about math acceleration. Um, and there is no plan for K through two. There is no plan. I've asked numerous times, numerous emails, numerous phone calls. Um, I've yet to see a plan. I know it's not necessarily, wasn't logistically uh, feasible last year when we were in the middle of the school year to kind of rearrange things, but I was hopeful for this year that we would be in a place that uh, after we're talking six to eight months of time to reflect and figure out how to you know, reconfigure things, that we'd be in a place where we could um, offer what the state requires. Um, so I guess as board members, I would ask that um, you know, kind of engage with the administration and work to make sure that this happens. Um, I will tell you that I also think the, the district doesn't believe in acceleration before third grade, and so they bury the one sentence about it at the very bottom as like almost a footnote, um, which was supposed the, the by the administration's pop, you know plan. They were supposed to have a plan in place in June. That's what the website still says today that the plan will be updated by June 2022. And we're now two weeks two weeks away from school, and there is no plan in place. It says to reach out to the, the building, uh, your building's principal, um, and you get nothing. So that that has happened. You get nothing because there's no plan. So there's nothing that can be done. Um, so I guess I'm a frustrated parent that just wants the district to follow the law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments in the time remaining? Okay. Um, we're going to skip over recess. Um, we're going to move on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet for materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the July 11th, 2022 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion carries to approve the minutes of the July 11th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. Next is the consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call for all? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. The motion carries. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the pack of materials. Uh, moving on to our recommendations for action. First up is the consideration of a resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of the district of the general election to be held on November 8, 2022. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of school district number 58 to Page County, Illinois at the general election to be held on the eighth day of November, 2022? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I would just like to say then that, um, you know, this, this um, for people who don't follow the board very often, 
um, are, are watching us tonight, um, either live or uh, in an archived YouTube video. Um, the appearance might be that six people plus a, some administrators are um, deciding to put a, a question on the ballot to um, support the to, to uh, support the, the the raising of funds to improve our, our buildings. Um, I want to assure everybody in our community this was not something that was done in a vacuum. Uh, we, um, going back several years, have been engaging with the community on this. This was there were many themes that resonated in the um, in the process we went through a few years ago with strategic planning, and those were those sentiments were reinforced when we. Um, when, you came, when we gathered together a, um, the, the Citizens. Citizens Task Force and uh, a group of, of individuals that um, represent our community um, from different stakeholder groups, you know, obviously parents of students, but also people in the community who don't have kids in our schools as well and try to, to be as uh, diverse as a group, of a group as we possibly could. And so we are, have been listening for many years. Um, yes, these are, these are issues that are near and dear to us as, as we are all parents, but we've been engaging with our community and listening and, and wanting to do what's best. Um, I think the administration did a fantastic job in reaching out to the community um, in, the, in the last many months uh, and having meetings and, and um, talking to people and, and, and listening to what, what we want. So this is, this is an effort to, um, to put this on, on the ballot to give people some um, agency over their schools and to decide the futures. This is, this is a, this has been something that we've been long looking forward to, but something we feel like we have been doing in concert with our, our stakeholders. Right. Um, um, I'll just name that, um, when we look at the, what we're asking for in terms of the facilities and the needs, our newest building in the district has very likely had two generations of families going through those buildings without significant maintenance and improvements to the guts of the building. Our oldest buildings just have had easily three generations of families. Uh, and I know Downers Grove, we have families that stay here and live here. Uh, they've had three generations of families go through those buildings uh, with some significant needs uh, under, the, uh, under the surface for those, uh, for those spaces. And so um, we are not talking about a new STEM wing. We're not talking about uh, a new you know, uh, 21st century science lab for uh, kindergartners. Uh, these are Things that, those are things that I would love to be able to improve tonight. Uh, that's not where, where we are as a district right now. Uh, we have great staff, we have uh, a great administration, and we believe that our students need facilities that are going to stay up to date with the needs that they have when they show up every day, assuming that it's going to be safe, assuming that they'll be able to learn, and assuming the conditions are right for uh, continuing to move through our buildings. And so um, what we're asking for, the, uh, what we, if we were to approve it tonight, uh, what we're asking for from the community is to stay current, as current as possible. Um, and right now, we're kind of playing catch up. Is uh, really what I'd be, uh, what I, the way that I would frame this, uh, this referendum that, that hopefully goes on the ballot. Anything else? All right, uh, Melissa, will you please call roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. The motion carries to adopt the resolution providing for and requiring the submission of the proposition of issuing school building bonds to the voters of school district number 58, DuPage County, Illinois, at the general election to be held on the eighth day of November 2022. Up next is the FY23 Consolidated District Plan. Is there a motion to approve the District 58 Consolidated, Dis consolidated District Plan for the 2022-2023 school year? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. The motion carries to approve the District 58 Consolidated District Plan for the 2022-2023 school year. Um, item C, the Serious Safety Hazard Designations for 2022-23. Is there a motion to designate the areas in the attached memo as Serious Safety Hazards for the 2022-2023 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No. Nope. Is there any changes from last year? No, there um, are no changes from last year. Last year did include the new addition of the middle school route uh, for O'Neill Middle School, which would be that area east of Fairview, but there are no changes from uh, last year. Perfect. Mm 
Okay, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Motion carries to designate the areas in the attached memo as serious safety hazards for the 2022-2023 school year. Item D is a bid for snow removal. Is there a motion to award the snow removal bid for all schools to Langton Group of Woodstock, Illinois? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, just a shout out to our, uh, our facilities team here. It had been pretty easy just to say a one bid option to put out there for 13 buildings to remove, to remove snow. Uh, and our facilities team went through, our, our uh, team went through the effort of saying, we could potentially divide it up and hopefully get more bidders or you know uh, offer it to a smaller company, uh, potentially someone that's more local or something of that sort. And so I appreciate the work that was put into thinking about this uh, often mundane type of bidding process in a different way. Most of you please roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. <coughs> Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. The motion carries to award the snow removal bid for all schools to Langton Group of Woodstock, Illinois. Um, we have some announcements. Uh, we have one announcement. Um, the next regular uh, meeting of this body will be on Monday, September 12th at 7 p.m., but it will be taking place at O'Neill Middle School. Are there any other announcements that we have? Just the first day of school is coming yeah. up, and we're excited to see the kids. Very yeah. excited. <laughs> Everyone enjoy your last few weeks of school. I had a question. Summer. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, enjoy your last few weeks of summer. Well, I'm guessing the uh, we'll get previews from principals on when students can come and like do the day before or the previous day prior yeah. to that. That's a great question. So, um, and, and please jump in if I misspeak. I'm going from memory here. Um, we um, will send out a message to families that will include not only when they will get their class assignment, but also when they can do the meet and greet. I believe we have that scheduled for the last hour of the day teachers are at work the Tuesday before the start of the school year. Um, 2.45 to 3.45. Excuse me, Justin? Until 3.30. Yeah, 2.45 until 3.30. That is when students can drop off their um, supplies, do a quick meet and greet with their teachers so they can be familiar with their new classroom setting prior to the start of the school year. Um, we've done similar things in the past. Uh, it is streamlined across the district where that will take place in every building. And again, that will be that Tuesday before the first uh, day of school. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to for a discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act? whether for purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2065 ILCS 120 slash 2 C 21. So moved. Second. During discussion. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess at uh, 8, 11. Yeah. Just for the board.